When will you be back? The dying sailor croaks through clattering teeth as he lazily shifts his eyes towards his comrade. His voice weak and barely audible over the constant howling of the Arctic wind. His friend can't bring himself to meet his gaze, instead choosing to watch as the rest of the party begins the long march south. Soon, he lies. They both know it. He pulls the tattered cloth over the boat to shield his doomed friend from the Arctic stinging gale. This, along with a few spoiled tins of food and a musket, are the last mercy he can provide as he stands to follow the others. Neither will live to tell the tale. The Franklin Expedition was part of an ongoing effort to find the fabled Northwest Passage, a sea route that would provide quick and easy access to Asia by sailing north of Canada. Now, if you have any basic idea about Canada, you'll know that it's pretty cold up there and that you'd have to be a completely deranged psychopath to sail north of those frozen shores. So when the British Admiralty went looking for a man to lead this expedition, they ran into some hurdles. Their first choice was too tired of risking his life in the Arctic and declined the offer. The second choice was too committed to his wife, to whom he had promised he would stop taking risky adventures to the north. Their third choice was too young to lead such an expedition. Their fourth choice was too hostile. Their fifth choice was too poor and Irish. That left the 59-year-old Arctic veteran Sir John Franklin, a man who had once led an expedition so disastrous that he earned the nickname, The Man Who Ate His Boots. But despite this questionable reputation, he was an experienced explorer and was perfectly qualified for a task like this. Franklin was assigned two vessels, the aptly named Erebus after the Greek god of darkness and the Terror. It's unlikely they knew just how apt these names would be, but despite their foreboding names, these ships were top-of-the-line exploring vessels. They had internal steam heating to keep the crew warm, and a reinforced hull to help survive impact with the ice. They had even converted diesel train engines to move the ship at a whopping 7 miles an hour with its screw propeller. It was the first of its kind in the Royal Navy. Franklin, only wanting the best for his men, made sure they had stocked up on the journey with more than a thousand books and placed a rush order for 8,000 tins of food to last for about three years. Once they were stocked, they made a few quick stops in northern Scotland and Greenland to get the last of their supplies and drop off five lucky sailors who weren't feeling very well. The two ships departed into Baffin Bay, where they were spotted by a few European whalers as they waited for conditions to improve to make the dash across Lancaster Sound. This was the last time the Erebus and the Terror and her 129 men were seen alive by Europeans. Following the clues, we can tell the expedition spent the winter camped on Beachy Island. The remains of their campsite have been found, along with the graves of three men who are believed to have died of tuberculosis. In the summer, the ice melted enough for Franklin to get underway again, eventually arriving at King William Island. Here they had a choice. They could go southeast or they could go southwest. And seeing as they were looking for the Northwest Passage, it's not hard to figure out why they chose the westerly route. If you're looking for west, you go West. This is the price of exploration. You don't know what you don't know. You only make decisions based on the information you have at the time. And if they knew then what we know now, they would understand that this course of action would put them directly in the flow of millions of tons of ice cruising down from the Arctic, and that the strait they were looking to sail through could easily stay frozen and impassable for years on end. It's a complete death trap that even modern ships avoid whenever possible. You can even check on Wikipedia and see this section of Victoria Strait is labeled as, quote, ice choked, and for good reason. But the Franklin Expedition did not have satellite imagery, the internet, or frankly any idea of what was up here in the Arctic. They just knew that if they needed to go west, they should go west. And in roughly September of 1846, both ships got stuck in the ice off the northwestern tip of King William Island. But well, this is kind of fine. They had three years worth of provisions. They could just wait for the ice to melt in the spring and get underway again. So they waited. Winter came and went. The ice, however, did not. While they were still stuck in the ice, the explorers decided to pen a note and stowed it inside a cairn constructed by a previous explorer called Sir James Ross. Note that for the sake of brevity and clarity, I'm going to remove some of the nautical terms here. You can find this note on the internet if you want it. So here's the quote. 20th of May, 1847. HMS ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice. 
having wintered in 4647 at Beachy Island after having ascended the Wellington Channel and returned to the west side of Cornwallis Island. Sir John Franklin commanded the expedition. All is well. Parting consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on Monday the 24th of May, 1847. So far, so good, right? They've wintered, Franklin is still in charge, they're just waiting for the weather to turn so they can get underway again. And so, they waited. And waited. And waited. Summer came and passed. Then fall. The ice never relented. The weather never turned. They were well and truly stuck. About a year after the first note, a second was scribbled into the margins, its tone drastically different from the year prior. It read, quote, 25th of April, 1848. HMS Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues north-northwest of Vis, having been beset since 12th September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls, under the command of Captain F.R.M. Cozier, landed here. This paper was found by Lieutenant Irving under the Karen, supposed to have been built by Sir James Ross in 1831, four miles to the northward, where it had been deposited by the late Commander Gore in May of 1847. Sir James Ross's pillar has not, however, been found, and the paper has been transferred to this position, which is that in which Sir James Ross's pillar was erected. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths of this expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. James Fitz James, captain of the HMS Erebus, and F.R.M. Crozier, captain and senior officer, Start tomorrow, the 26th, for the Bax Fist River. To summarize, they have abandoned the ships. Franklin is dead. 105 sailors are now marching south, trying to hike to the Bax Fist River, about 200 miles away as the crow flies. And then they're going to try to travel several hundred miles downriver to reach any resemblance of civilization. They've loaded their supplies into boats and then pulled them like sleds across the snow and ice and are now walking. From here, all written records of the Franklin Expedition vanish. Now, it's not necessarily wrong for the British Admiralty to wait a few years before sending a search party. This was an expedition that was supposed to take several years, and you don't go ringing alarm bells two years into a three-year journey. However, Jane Franklin, Sir Franklin's wife, was an absolute maverick who refused to take no for an answer. When the Navy decided not to go looking for Sir Franklin, she started fundraising on her own, appealing to public support to fund seven expeditions out into the Arctic over the course of the next 25 years. She became so famous for her efforts that people started to say, what a nation would not do, a woman did. It was a rather black eye for the most powerful Navy on earth to be one upped by an 1800s woman that they considered to be a second class citizen. Good on you, Lady Franklin. So. What did you find? Well, they never found Franklin or his ships or any of his crew alive, but according to multiple oral histories from separate local Inuit groups, the expedition had been trapped in the ice for a few years. During that time, the locals traded with the Englishmen and even took them out on a few hunts. But one day, they all packed up and started marching south, leaving corpses and supplies along the way. Eventually, a group of 40 of these men camped at the mouth of the Bax River, where they slowly starved to death. In a last desperate attempt to cling to life, the survivors chopped up the corpses of their colleagues, ate what little meat they could butcher, and even cooked and cracked a few of the bones open to devour what little marrow they could. A few men survived for a few years, heading south and hunting for game, but they vanished into the vast Canadian north, never to be seen again. And how did Lady Franklin react to the news? Well, she called them all liars, and launched a smear campaign trying to discredit the stories of the Inuit people. She basically called them all a bunch of savage snow dog liars. She recruited Charles Dickens to harass the explorers for believing the oral histories, only stopping just shy of claiming that these natives have slaughtered these good British boys as a human sacrifice towards their dark pagan gods, tarring and feathering the careers of the very explorers she had hired to go and find her husband. That's, uh, that's pretty racist there, Lady Franklin. Shame, I kind of liked you there for a second. But the British public was more than willing to listen to the propaganda. They did not want to hear that these great British boys could have possibly resorted to the barbaric practice of cannibalism. They stuck their heads in the sand 
and claimed that the natives must have ambushed these good explorers at the earliest opportunity. They said their Franklin expedition was a tragic victim of frontier violence at the hands of the locals. This was pretty much the accepted story for a hundred years until modern archaeologists, guided by the local Inuit population, were able to uncover several campsites left behind by the Franklin expedition. They found corpses, discarded supplies, and cooking pots full of human remains. It's almost as if the native people, who experienced the tragedy firsthand with a rich oral history, knew what they were talking about. But where were the ships? The Europeans had never been able to uncover the resting place of the terror in the Erebus. If only they had local guides telling them, repeatedly, exactly where the ships were. If only the locals had literally drawn them a map of where the wrecks had last been spotted in the ice and told them, over and over again, hey, the ships are in the Uchuluk, off the coast of King William Island. One was crushed by the ice and the other drifted towards shallow water before being abandoned. Eventually, the modern researchers had the bright idea to ask the locals where to shirts for the ships, and the Inuits pointed them in the same direction they had been pointing for the past 150 years. Modern sonar was able to pick up the outlines of these wrecks beneath the ice and discover the Erebus in 2014 and the Terror in 2016. Who would have ever guessed that the people who experienced the tragedy firsthand and had a rich oral tradition would have known exactly what they were talking about? The exact cause of death for the crew remains a bit of a mystery. Some claim they were suffering from lead poisoning due to the hasty canning process and the rushed order of food. Maybe it was scurvy or pneumonia or tuberculosis. The list of causes really runs the gambit. But if you ask me, it probably has something to do with the fact that if you're not prepared to be stuck in a frozen wasteland for several years in a row, sometimes things go south. And if your best course of action is to walk blindly into the Canadian Arctic out of hopes of reaching civilization, then you're probably already dead. Mother Nature may be beautiful, but she is not known for her mercy. The story of the Franklin Expedition lies somewhere between myth and history. The sailors took the real story to their graves all those years ago, and we're left to pick up the pieces and try to patch together what we believe happened. The long and short of it is they all died a slow, miserable death in a frozen wasteland far from home, alone. May God have mercy on their souls. I've been Mark. I'll see you next time. Take care.